as in many ways Poland is, or uh, Georgia in your, in your own part of the world. And in other parts of the world, South Korea or Singapore. Hong Kong now had, Hong Kong at the, uh, in, in, in the late 1940s had an income per head the same as mainland China, as they call it. And now its income per head is higher than that of the United States. You can achieve that on this optimistic theme that um, John and Dan have, 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 uh, have introduced. If you can achieve 3% growth per capita per year, and after all, China, even with its slowdown, is growing well over 6% per year. India is growing at the same rate. If, if you, you can achieve 3% real growth per capita every year in a, cup, in, in, a, um, in a couple of short generations, you can increase income by a factor of four. Your income now is about um, $52 a day per capita. In the United States, it's now $140 a day per capita. But you can catch up. Hong Kong did. How did Hong Kong achieve that? How, do, how, does, how, how did Georgia grow? It's, it's still quite uh, um, poor, but it was even poorer once. By free enterprise, in a phrase. It didn't come as the Marxists express it. I was, a, I was once a, a Marxist when I was a child, like most of you, <laughs> most of you young people. I was a Marxist. And I thought that economic growth came from exploiting the working class. Or, alternatively, exploiting the third world. It's not very plausible. It's a little odd that you exploit part of the society and then the whole society increases from the $3 a day in modern terms that the whole world earned in 1800, with minor exceptions of $6 a day in a place like Holland or Britain, $3 a day worldwide to the present worldwide average of about $33 a day, which is Brazil. That's an amazing change and available to you if you will, to, if you will arrange for it is um, $140 a day $200 a day, take your pick. Nor is it caused by investment. Now this sounds strange. It's an odd thing to say. You need capital. You need buildings and microphones that sometimes work. Um, uh, and, and you need books like mine. Books, you need, books, you need capital. And you need human capital, the sort that <clears throat> many of you are now accumulate. But that it's necessary doesn't make it anything like sufficient. That it's that that you need air. I mean we can hardly achieve three dollars a day if we didn't have any air to breathe. We would all die. So you could say, I have a theory of economic growth, it's the air theory. Air. Got to have that air. My claim about investment in capital is that it's derivative from opportunity. When there's opportunity created by ordinary uh, people becoming extraordinary and trying out new ideas, opening.
inventing a hairdressing salon, inventing a new kind of motor, whatever, then the investment is rather easy to assemble. You think of uh, uh, capital is not a, a, a great concern. Foreign trade, which you'll be told often is the source of economic growth, is not the source of economic growth. It's desirable to have free trade is a, a very important um, um, stimulus to enterprise, ingenuity, uh, entrepreneurship, but it's not foreign exports are not the same thing as income. Uh, so it, you can achieve it. Now, I come from Chicago. Chicago in the late 19th century was the fastest growing um, city in the world in a country whose income per head was growing very fast at that 3% per year that I talked about. Chicago in the late 19th century was fantastically corrupt. Uh, it was, shall I say, worse than Romania. It was, every judge was for sale. Every, every policeman was. So where does this ingenuity come from? Where does, where does widespread <coughs> enterprise, new locations for businesses, new apartment buildings, an idea for locating a new apartment building, an idea for a new machine or a new app, as, as Dan said. It comes from equality. It's not equality that, um, that Piketty talks about. It's not equality of income. It's equality of rights to the rule of law, the right to make contract, equality before the law, as we say. That's the English expression on the one hand. But unlike my colleagues here, I would say that, that equality before the law is not, is not quite enough. There also needs to be dignity for ordinary people. There needs to be honor to entrepreneurs, honor to ordinary workers. People need to be treated well. Um, uh, uh, women need to be freed. The Roma need to be freed. We need to treat each other as honorable in our enterprise. Now, one final thought. The floor, as John expressed it, is ethics is ideology, the decline of hierarchy, the decline of the idea that we're not equal, that men are superior to women, that lords are superior to peasants, that government officials are superior to ordinary citizens, that politicians are superior to everyone. That needs to break down and that's an ethical change. It's a change in how you all think about each other and think about the rule of law. If you're not indignant, if you're not angry at corruption, if you're not in, indignant and angry at, at inequality of respect and honor for each other, then you won't have an economy that can grow at 3% a year per, per capita. It, 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 it's, 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 it's ethical, political, I would say rhetorical. A change in how you, how you talk about each other is fundamental to really fast economic growth. 
Now you can grow at 1% per year, but alas, in real terms, but alas, then it will take 140 years for income to increase by a factor of four. It will take about 70 or 72 years for it to merely increase by a factor of two. I think Romania can do much better than that. Thank you. Again, if there are any brief pointed questions or comments. I have one. Very short. Sure. Yeah. Very yes, sure. very short. Sure. Yes. Uh, questions first, or comments? First one. Oh, one comment, one question. The first comment is the following. Unfortunately, we have less Marxist, Marxists that became liberals or libertarians than liberals that became Marxists. So it's it's good to see a, people, a person that changed the, the, the sides. There are lots of us. I think not. Worldwide. You are the first person that, that I meet in the last years. So, But I, I saw a lot of opposite persons. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because Marxism is well published, it's well paid, it's, yeah, yeah. it's well uh, priced by nobles and yeah. Nobel prizes and so on. So you have a lot of advantages to be a Marxist <laughs> less than to be a liberal. Yeah. Okay, so well, this was okay, a comment. Okay, 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 can I simply comment on that? That's only true in academic life. <laughs> yeah. It's not true in the world. In academic life it's very true. In an academic life it's very true. I'm a professor of English. All my friends are in, in English, or at least Mark so Yeah, well published, well ranked, and yeah. so on. Yeah. But but there was a there was a cartoon cover of our magazine, the National Review, last August. It's truly brilliant. It showed that classic face portrait of Karl Marx with his beard and everything. But he was a cool guy. He had a, a, a little hat. He had a Starbucks coffee and an MP3 player in his, uh, in his uh, ear, and you know, he's so cool. And it's, uh, he had a shirt on that said, still wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the question, uh, it's, uh, it's the following. You discussed about 3% real growth when per capita is necessary for yeah. catching up and so on. I want to say that this economic growth is very complicated to be uh, defined, to be measured. And uh, uh, how do you see an economic growth rate that is including also an increasing the level of debt for a country, for instance? Okay, I'm increasing the public debt, that is the debt of, any, of no one's, in fact. It is included in that growth rate. We can achieve 3%, but with it a lot of debt accumulated, such as China accumulated also, <coughs> Japan, Germany, and so on. So uh, real economic growth should be well defined <coughs> in that case. Well, I, I've spent my life thinking about economic growth, and so, so have you, I take it. And um, I, 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 there, people say there are doubts about measuring national income or this, that, and the other. But I think you'll agree that in gross terms, the United States and Hong Kong are much better off than Romania. But unfortunately, they don't speak Romanian, so they the, don't know the public Romanian debt. poetry. Yeah, the public debt of both countries that you mentioned there, per capita, it's higher than the public debt per capita yeah, for Romania. The, the public debt is, is not, you know, I, I, if we, if we can do in Romania what we're suggesting, what the, what the liberals are suggesting, we're going to have smaller government. It's grotesque how government has grown in the last century in most countries. We don't need 40% of consumption to go through the government. And if we don't have 40% going through the government, we're not going to have big government debt. So and, and in any case, don't worry. Believe me, I promise you, government debt is not an, an immense problem. But what is a problem 
is regulation, crony capitalism, failure of the rule of law, um, and indignity, although this isn't really true in Romania, but, in, but, but contempt for entrepreneurs. Q and A at the end, so let me give the floor to our last speaker. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizer for including me in this panel with so well renowned journalists and economists, so I'm in the underdog. <laughs> I will be a little bit more ferocious, but more probably toothless than <laughs> the those who are so here. So um, I was uh, intrigued by the general theme, uh, theme of this uh, of this uh, meeting, how to create growth. And uh, just uh, I was uh, I was reading the Mari Rothbard, and uh, he has a very interesting chapter on um, let's say uh, underlining the role of statistics. In, uh, in national planning, in national economic planning. And uh, fundamentally, uh, without denying the role of statistics in any free society, in any capitalist society, uh, this uh, respected economist argued that without statistics, uh, there would be, not say no planning, but really <laughs> hard work and uh, uh, difficulties in uh, economic planning. So, uh, so uh, fundamentally, uh, measuring economic growth is so important that it should uh, not be led to some uh, groups of economists, even they are calling themselves statisticians, and they would, should be those who <coughs> to calculate this uh, this growth, this economic growth. So, uh, when debating policies that create growth. Uh, economists uh, should clarify uh, the grammatics the, of, of this uh, debate because uh, just pointing to the GDP, the gross domestic product, as a single indicator that summarizes everything what's inside a society, a complex and modern society, it is not only uh, aggregating but holistic, yes? is not a reductionist but uh, sim terrible simplifying and I, I recall what political uh, philosopher qualified individuals like uh, so-called violent demagogues like Stalin or Hitler, terrible simplifiers. They, they put the, an entire complex debate in just some si simple arguments where were so cut from reality that just some kind of verbal gymnastics. So when we hear more modern and democratic politicians arguing about 5% inflation is better than 5% unemployment, it is the same kind of terrible simplification that uh, somehow, I don't say it should be forbidden, <laughs> but uh, it uh, generates purely and simply uh, wrong uh, debates. So, uh, I, I was uh, somehow uh, puzzled at one point when this measurement of economic growth started. <coughs> and uh, one of the dilemma of any individual who is interested in economics is that the 18th and 19th century we have so much growth without measuring it. So, without <laughs> government policies that focus on economic growth. In fact, <coughs> uh, I, I found that uh, the measurement of economic growth this single indicator, like GDP, was uh, started in the United States. We always refer to the United States because it is more open to debate. <laughs> uh, just in uh, 1932, during the Great Recession, when, uh, in fact, uh, President Roosevelt uh, attempted to plan, more plan the economy. And he needed these tools, because without these tools, you are just uh, uh, somehow, I, I, I like a very funny, and I think it's very true uh, situation. It is argued that uh, the central planners in the Soviet Union had no idea about 
the, the agricultural output in the Soviet Union. So, because the Americans were spying and assessing by satellite the agricultural output of Soviet Union, Soviet Union, the Soviet Union spied on the Americans in order to assess its own production of uh, agricultural production. So, this is some kind of and the reality of. Uh, cannot uh, producing so-called economic policies uh, in, in the situation that you lack statistics. And uh, starting from this uh, uh, discussion, I, I, I want and all this uh, all uh, of the members of this panel uh, highlighted the idea that when uh, liberals discuss with other types of uh, politicians or social scientists the comparative advantages of free markets and capitalist societies, we should not put, uh, go into the trap of discussing, uh, let's say, how free markets generate more growth than <coughs> interventionist politics. The fundamental uh, advantage of capitalism and free markets is an ethical and moral one, before a uh, quantitative one. So. Uh, Obviously, when you discuss and you see at televised discussions that, uh, let's say, a socialist politician argues that his policy will create more kilometers of highway, and the liberal politician somehow has no argument, <laughs> it does not mean that still free markets and capitalism is in a comparative disadvantage. <coughs> I, I bet that. For ancient Egypt, when they built pyramids, uh, they had a lot of economic growth, nominal economic growth, as compared to other uh, free societies. So, uh, I repeat this, uh, this, this point, and uh, uh, I, I just uh, wanted to argue even more when you mm when you take into consideration this uh, measurement of economic growth and uh, I identified at least, let's say, four models. Uh, the Soviet one, when you had no idea about the real uh, economic phenomena in the, in the society. Uh, the so-called uh, the Greek model, and I, I recall you the, the scandal about how Greece, together with some financial institutions, just purely and simply uh, manipulated the macroeconomic indicators in order to qualify for the Eurozone. And it was creative accounting at the national level, which was more dangerous than uh, at the business level. We had also a Romanian model from time to time before elections. It seems that the National Institute of Statistics just window dressing <laughs> by 0 0.5 the, the rate of growth and always overvaluing, never undervaluing it <laughs> and uh, again it is measuring economic growth and basing policies on this indicator is, is some kind of beauty contest because uh, it focuses at least in my opinion on irrelevant uh, dimensions of of the real debate. And uh, just uh, about pitfalls and fraud, yes? the, the European model, the European Commission realized that uh, in order to <coughs> keep reporting growth, they had to include uh, the informal economy, like prostitution and so on, just to, um, to report such a continuing economic growth. So, uh, um, obviously, economic growth, and this is my final remark, is a, is a beneficial uh, consequence in a free society. Even if I may argue that in a free society, economic contraction and shrinking is not so bad, because it is a choice of individuals. If we decide this year to dance and take vacation, that's no problem, because we are still, this our choice. But uh, fundamentally, and fortunately, as, as, as uh, you already said, the capitalism and free markets may have lower nominal growth than 
interventionist economies, but fundamentally it is a sounder growth. You don't expect in a free society, in a free economy, to witness recessions absent the institutional setting that generates such a, such a consequence. So uh, we should not be uh, focused too much on this quantitative approach to our society and just attempt to, to put all this society on the, on the correct institutional setting, that is private property and freedom of exchange. Thank you.
I mean, they're, they're, they have faults. Uh, I'd like to have the whole distribution, and I'd like to blah, blah, blah. But the, if, look, ask yourself this. From the economic point of view, sure, j just in terms of goods and services that you can get, would you rather be in the United States or in Romania? Now, in Romania, you get the advantage of being fully Romanian. And as I said, you can read Romanian poetry anytime you want, and you have a great uh, culture, and well, that's right. But from a sheerly economic point of view, I assert that you would prefer to be in a place with an income per person of $140 a day than one with $52 a day. Yes, I might abuse the privilege of being the chair and ask a question to all the panelists, so to speak. Uh, the, the idea of fixing the rule of law came up, you know, I think, in almost all the speeches. And uh, the point was uh, that we get from, in order to fix economics, we have to fix the rule of law, the law. And then even a few other steps were suggested. In order to fix the law, we might have to fix the ethics or the rhetorics of the matter, uh, how long is this journey in the end? So what, uh, uh, what do we have to keep fixing until everything gets, gets to be fixed? Because the economic problem seem to be the easiest one. Thank you very much. Well, this is a challenge because people get discouraged. You know, I'm not suggesting a creation of a new man. This is not my Marxist you know, theory that you somehow have to create a new Romanian or a new American who will obey the rule of law. These are imperfect structures. But the goal must always be in front of us and must always be apparent. We have examples from several countries around the world that have an astonishing economic growth at the same time that they developed a clear rule of law. South Korea would be a, a, a very important example. Uh, there are others. I was recently in South Korea, and what I was told was, remember, this was a military dictatorship until the 1980s. By definition, a military dictatorship does not follow the rule of law very often. It mostly follows the rule of men. Uh, it's vastly more efficient. And how is it that South Korea now has the confidence of the entire world that its systems and institutions can be trusted, people can engage in contracts, they will be enforced? I mean, I realize Apple is on everybody's mind, but Samsung, this one, is a South Korean company, easily outsells Apple worldwide. How is it that a country that was on the IMF list of the poorest countries in the world in 1960, now as a world leader in things like this. I th what I was told in South Korea was, if you have strong moral institutions, especially the family, and also strong interpersonal relationships, you can build um, and, and establish a rule of law much more quickly than you can in countries that are fractured by tribal or um, have horrible leg historical legacies to a revenge that they have to deal with. Uh, I'm always told that one of the few things that people appreciated about the communist era was that people had very few friends, but those friends you had really trusted. So you had to. <laughs> Building trust in a society is far beyond my competency. But I do know that it must begin with the family. It must begin with your circle of friends, neighbors, and relatives. And it also must begin by all of you deciding that together you can do something, you can improve things. Uh, both in Britain and in some cities, perhaps not Chicago, anti-corruption leagues were formed. Reform, if you find a reform club, in, in, in London or in New York or someplace, it's where reformers used to gather. And they could come from every part of the political spectrum. But they all agreed 
that a country needed to have honesty and trust and needed to have the rule of law. This, these are not principles that are ideological in the sense of parties. These are universal values and universal truths. And one of the things that you must do in this country is reach out and build a broad coalition of people, social democrats, national liberals, whatever, uh, the ethnic minorities. And you all must agree that, to, that each of you are going to be better off if there's a rule of law. And in fact, the irony is the atomization, the alienation, the fear, the distrust, of the communist era in Romania is the thing that's holding you back. Because all of this destroyed trust. All of this destroyed honesty. All of this destroyed the ability to enter into the long-term contracts with the future to try to build something. So you have psychic damage in this country, even after 25 years. But you also have young people who have never had this psychic damage. They've grown up in a different Romania. An imperfect Romania, but one in which trust has gradually been built back. You have to build a broad coalition for honesty, integrity, and truth, and not just make it a political issue. You must make it a patriotic issue. Can I just add to that? I think that's a great way of expressing it. this. This 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 focus on the family is, I think, crucial. Rule of law sounds very ma macho and masculine to me. Most of the time, you don't go to law if you have a dispute over a contract. As John says, it's more about trust and the enforcement mechanisms, that's also macho, about, about trust. But as John says, the family is crucial here. And that makes women crucial. This is a point that my old colleague, Theodore Schultz, a Nobel Prize winner, used to make. If the mothers of the country want their children to read, everyone learns to read. It's, 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 it's the mothers that are, you know, this sounds kind of crazy and sentimental, but it's not. It's, that's where ethics is created inside the family. So, so I, I think there is a deeply, f if you pardon me, a deeply, f a deeply f f feminist part of this. One of the reasons that South Korea is such an amazing example is the crazy South Korean mothers who insist on their boys and their girls studying all the time. Tiger moms. Tiger moms. Mm -hmm. So they now speak English much better than the Japanese do. Much example. better than the Americans. Well, <laughs> most <laughs> Americans. But it's not for price. I, I know several Korean students, and they are usually yeah. quite mm -hmm. impressed because they are forced into schools, they are forced into the yeah, yeah, okay. family to study, even if they don't want to play, they're not yeah, interested. But, but you'll agree that that some of that is good. The, the amount may be excessive in South Korea. But anyway, I, I'm just saying that there is a feminist angle on this that we must not forget. So we want to take questions? Yeah, let's do it. We, we, we'll talk forever if you let us. Yeah, we'll take it from the left here. Yeah. Because now there's just one. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll, I have a question that actually extends to all of the panelists, so I'm curious. <laughs> they run the show. In, in whatever order, it doesn't matter. But I'm curious, what would be the ideal family model to follow in order, in order to have an actual ethical society? Because I know that in the United States, there's a big question on what family means right now, in the sense whether it's, it's a, a monoparental family or gay marriage or all sorts of things like that. What would be an ethical family to have an ethical society? An ethical family is one with ethical parents, more or less, period. And whether it's two men or two women or a man or a woman or a single woman or a single man, I don't care. Who cares? As long as the kids go to bed when they're told to. As long as the kids learn that it's really nasty to steal from people and to insult them. 
and to treat them with contempt. This egalitarianism that we talk about. I think that's the, uh, the raw material for a free society. Just, just very briefly, my, my political party in Germany um, also is very, very easily. A family is, is that combination of people that takes up responsibility of one another. So whether it's one woman, one child, one woman, two children, one man and a child, two men and two children, it doesn't really matter. The most important part is that you take up responsibility for raising those children right. And giving them a moral compass, meaning that you have respect for other people, that you have tolerance, that you don't steal, as has been mentioned, and that you treat people the way you want to be treated by others. That is the important part. Thank you. Okay, I, I want to come back a little bit to the rule of law. In Romania, yeah, very sure. In Romania, for instance, my government in the last five years didn't double the money supply. In the United States, the government doubled the money supply in the last three years. Is there more or less rule of law in this case? <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. The most difficult thing when you have a constitution is that there will always be people who try to go outside the boundaries and try to break through the guardrails created by any constitution or set of rules. Ultimately, the best enforcement mechanism is always in the culture of the country. Enough people say no. That is not in our tradition. That is not what we intended. It's not what's written down. This is why the time to move towards a rule of law is when things are relatively normal. When people have the time and the opportunity to discuss such things. You never want to do it in the middle of a crisis. A crisis is disastrous for the rule of law for stability because people will always say, this is an emergency. Yeah, that's right. We must suspend everything. Well, yes, in many countries an emergency means martial law and there are tanks in the streets. Uh, so the time to discuss this and of course, I think the actions of the Federal Reserve have exceeded. I, I think the Federal Reserve itself is unconstitutional, but that's a separate issue, which I don't want to go into. Yes. But the time to set down these rules and to try to establish enforcement mechanisms and to try to teach people a culture of accountability and respect for the rule of law is when things are relatively normal. Do not wait for the next crisis. The next crisis will threaten your country's future threaten the rule of law, and threaten uh, the stability that you want. Uh, we, we want to have one of the panelists. Uh, 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 I think uh, because I have always am the <laughs> nuts. <laughs> uh, this is also um, a very sensitive discussion because uh, uh, the rule of law, um, imagine Soviet Union, and the judicial system that aggressively implements the rules of law. It is a point that it should be the rules that are closer to natural law, to, to a system that enforces such uh, laws. So, so the quality of law is important. Yes, because uh, Before the rule of law, uh, uh, let's say, ignores the problems how rules are made. And uh, you may have an independent judiciary that enforces uh, aggressively the wrong rules. Yeah, and that's the point you, you said very correctly. Maybe alternative sources of rulemaking, like contractual, like uh, arbitrage, and uh, different uh, informal mechanisms to enforce contracts and agreements should be developed. One of the, uh, if I can just add something. I, I understand, but neither of us are the moderator. <laughs> Um, um, I will be brief, I promise. Thanks. Um, 
Our Declaration of Independence is only one of many examples in the world of natural law. It basically said all people throughout space and throughout time have certain natural rights and government cannot take them away. The European uh, Human Rights Declaration is in a similar vein. The four freedoms of the European, original European community along these lines. These are things that are the bedrock of human dignity, of human rights. So I agree with you. If there is a system of law that is trying to create arbitrary <coughs> powers over, uh, over people, violate their basic rights, you have a responsibility to fight against that. The rule of law is in order to protect natural rights, not to protect whatever the parliament says the law is. Just, just, just in that respect, um, in, in Germany in the beginning of the 1950s, there was something established called the, the Radbruch formula. For, for anyone student of law, that, that says um, any law that breaches basic fu fundamental human rights cannot be considered being a law and being within the rule of law. Because technically speaking, Germany, Nazi Germany was, yeah, there was rule of law. Concentration camp. Yeah. It's but, equal for everybody. Yeah, exactly. No, but, but don't, don't get us wrong when, when, when we're talking about rule of law as an important point. This is just one issue in the, in the matrix, one issue in the, in the equation. Respect for human beings, human dignity, goes together with rule of law. And if you have a law that goes against human dignity, we cannot consider this being in line with rule of law. Thank you. Uh, we, we were moving rightwards. I, I have a small comment to, to Mr. Kadek. I really enjoyed your speech and uh, I agree with your conclusion. I'm just curious, what do you mean when you say we have to shrink and grow? Because I understand that we have to shrink in uh, maybe in nominal terms, but does it really have to be a, a decrease in real terms? I mean, and some economists say that it's compatible from an economic point of view to have decrease in prices and increase in economic prosperity, basically. Uh, so this would be my, my question. Does this... Uh, shrinking has to be in real terms, or we just have to decrease practically or to stop credit expansion? Well, when you talk about credit expansion, I definitely say that we should shrink that. Uh, if you look at the European Central Bank giving you know, our loans to ridiculously low interest rate, yes, we should, have, should stop that. But if you talk about real economy, um, or so-called real economy, if you have state-supported enterprises and state-supported industry that does not create real value, but merely, well, sucks your, um, your taxpayers' money, then this has to be shut down. Because it doesn't bring anyone. We have to thank to jobs, but they hurt the real economy. They hurt you and they, they hinder actual economic growth. If you have a company like, let's say, postal service before the new regulation, at least in Germany. Um, sometimes it doesn't work too well in Romania, and we have an entrepreneur later who will talk about that. Yeah. But um, having this kind of industry being heavily subsidized hinders economic growth. So we have to deregulate and demolish this kind of industry, and that this will create a loss of jobs in the first place, and this will uh, lead to a de facto reduction of wealth. Um, of, of the of the aggregate economy, but what it does do, it sets free economic potential, and that is what Schumpeter describes as um, creative destruction. Only by this means there can be something new, something of real value, and this is something we have to strive for. If you look to Greece, and this is my favorite example, you have massively subsidized industry that does not create any real uh, value that doesn't resemble, resemble the real value of what they are producing. And this cannot be because it's all being done by taxpayers' money and hinders economic growth by hindering other companies competing in the market. So yes to both. We need to reduce um, excessive credits and we also have to reduce um, this artificial bubble mirage of an economy. Your question is very appropriate because today came the announcement that in Great Britain for the first time since 1960, 
prices fell last month. The first time. When we had a gold standard, when we had a fixed exchange, method of exchange, uh, deflation and inflation were probably two sides of the same coin. You could have one or the other and it all happened in a very narrow band. As a practical matter, not a theoretical matter, we're in an era in which deflation, absent Japan or some other unusual examples, is far less likely to occur than inflation. Inflation obviously has political incentives built behind it and various other things. So absent a complete reform of the monetary structure, we have to find mechanisms by which we can control inflation, control the natural expansion of government, the natural tendency of government to expand the money supply and credit as much as possible to use a very imperfect structure to achieve stability. Uh, so th in theory, yes. In practice, our real battle will always be against inflation. Thank you. Have a like five minutes or more. According to my calculation, so let's go further. Okay, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm Alex Fischer. I'm a student here at the Lincoln University, and also I work for the Mary Woodward Center. Um, I'm going a bit back in the discussion. Uh, some of our speakers uh, mentioned the South, in South Korea or Japan as so to say models for, for uh, growth and uh, having some specific uh, attributes that help them like with the family. Okay. Um, I'm a big fan of Japan and uh, I also no, I know many Japanese people and South Korean guys who always say about Romania that we are a very rich country in comparison to Japan or South Korea. And uh, we, when we meet them and uh, hear them saying these things, uh, we ask them why? Because you are the sixth country in the world, the third country in the world, and we are somewhere way behind. Well, you have uh, many natural resources, uh, you have very good soil, and uh, very many talented and young uh, smart people. We only have our people, so I think we should learn from them how to uh, focus our uh, efforts to grow, and uh, we can have a great deal of learning from them. That there, there's a persistent myth that natural resources are the basis of economic growth. If that were true, Congo would be the richest country in the world. You have to know how to use them. Yeah, of course you do. And, and, but, but knowing how to use them, it, it's just, it, it's deeply beside the point to point to land quality and, uh, and, and oil or something. But that wasn't true in 1800. When all this began, yes. land quality was just crucial, uh, but it's no longer so. Land in a country like the United States earns about maybe about 5% of national income, and that includes urban <coughs> location rents. It includes everything about what um, Ricardo called the original indestructible property of the soil. It doesn't matter. What matters now is human ingenuity. Your brain. Your brain. It's the resources between your ears that matter. Want to take one more? Thank you. Alexander Solzhen is my name. And uh, I would like to go back to your comment that uh, you give trust to your family <coughs> and you start giving trust to your family. My question is, uh, in order to give trust to somebody, you have to trust yourself. And in order to trust yourself, you have to know who you are and what you stand for. Now, we have to assume <coughs> that most people here don't know who they are and what they stand for. They, are, they were so busy surviving over the years that the question of what values you're willing to fight for but not a question most people consider it's a priority to, to think about. So maybe we, you know, your assumption that you start giving trust, you may have to go back one level below 
to discover what you stand for so that you gain a, you know, you can go to the Bill of Rights or to the Declaration of Independence. I, I accept what you say, but part of this is generational. Uh, my remarks were directed in large part under the assumption that a lot of people in this room are under the 25 years of age or, or younger, or under 30 or 35, and effectively all of your adult consciousness has been in, since 1989. So yes, for a previous generation, what you say is exactly right. We're talking about a new Romania. We're talking about a Romania in which the communist era will be increasingly distant. And I do believe it is important to build those structures of trust honesty and understanding. And frankly, even people who don't know who they are value honesty, want to be treated with integrity, the golden rule. I wish to be treated as others would treat me. And I think you can build a stable, ethical, moral society. You already have the basis of it, but you have to fine tune it. And it starts with the individual and the individual creating in alliance with others, a national patriotic movement that Romania can do better and it deserves better. Here, here. <coughs> okay, I have to say two things. The organizers uh, asked me about it. Uh, you will be happy to sign books, so those of you who have the, the little books uh, yeah. on your table, uh, profit. Opportunity. I was told to remind that there is a second panel, so Rad uh, was the last speaker from the first panel, so uh, before the second panel. And uh, I, can, I guess we can conclude here. Let's do a warm round of applause for our